Hey guys, so this is the story of the seven dwarfs of Auschwitz and their survival in one of the deadliest concentration camps operated by the Nazis during World War II. This story is mostly from the perspective of Perla Ovitz, who had dwarfism and was the youngest of 10 siblings in the Ovitz family. The family consisted of seven dwarf siblings and three average height siblings who in the 1940s were transferred from their small Romanian village to Auschwitz during the Nazi occupation throughout Europe. Miraculously, they all survived almost an entire year of hell at this death camp. But before we talk about Perla, we need to talk about her father, Shimshon Isaac. Shimshon Isaac was born in 1868 in Romania to a young couple. He was the third child of Freda and Leib Ovitz, and he shocked his parents when it was discovered that little Shimshon Isaac had dwarfism. He had pseudoachondroplasia, which is a type of dwarfism where the extremities or the arms and legs are disproportionately shorter than the rest of the body, among other physical features. Freda and Leib did not understand how this could be, how they, two average height people with no history of dwarfism in their family, could give birth to a dwarf. It was not known then, like it is known now, that for average height couples, dwarfism is the result of a spontaneous gene mutation. Freda and Leib took their son, Shimshon Isaac, to various doctors, medicine men, and although they tried all sorts of medicines and potions and magic spells, nothing worked. In adulthood, Shimshon Isaac would grow to be no taller than a five-year-old average height boy. Shimshon Isaac's parents knew that their son would have struggles in life due to his short stature. So they decided very early on that if he was going to stop growing, they were going to nurture his mind and make his brain his biggest weapon. They knew that he would not be able to survive if he had to do harsh labor on the family farm. So they put him on a path of academic excellence. Freda and Leib worked really hard to get Shimshon Isaac the best education and the best tutors that they could afford. And it worked. Shimshon Isaac Ovitz grew up to have a reputation of not only being incredibly intelligent and self-confident, but also very charming and very lively. When he was 19 years old, Shimshon Isaac decided he wanted to get married. Okay, so now because he was very well educated and he was also very well versed in his religious studies, which was something that was highly valued, Shimshon Isaac's short stature could be overlooked when selecting a bride. So he married 18-year-old Brana Gold in an arranged marriage. Shimshon Isaac and Brana would go on to have two children born in 1886 and 1889, both girls, Rosica and Francisca, who inherited their father's dwarfism. So now Shimshon Isaac is married and he decides to drop his religious studies and he seeks to become a barshan or a merrymaker. He was basically the master of ceremonies during special occasions, such as weddings. As a bachan, Shimshon Isaac was in charge of being the life of the party, of entertaining guests. He had to be charming, funny, quick-witted, knowledgeable. Before the event, he would actually do research on the family that hired him so that he could write songs about them or use that information in conversations or make them laugh with inside jokes. Shimshon Isaac had the ability to evoke such strong emotions in the guests that he would have them weeping one minute and roaring with laughter the next minute. He was able to walk into a room with strangers and entertain the crowd very easily. He was so skilled at what he did, he became well known for his entertainment services and people would actually book Shimshon Isaac months in advance. His role eventually evolved to also becoming a consultant to businessmen on investment opportunities. Unfortunately, in 1901, Shimshon Isaac's wife, Brana, died of tuberculosis at the age of 33, leaving behind her beloved husband and two young teenage daughters, Rosica and Francisca. Because Shimshon Isaac had such a good reputation and 
was wealthy and very religious, he was able to remarry a healthy 18-year-old named Batia, almost half his age, and together they had eight children, five of whom were dwarfs. With the two girls from Shimshon's Isaac's first marriage, there were a total of seven dwarf siblings in the family. First came Avram, a dwarf son in 1903, then Freda, a dwarf daughter in 1905, then Sarah, who was average height in 1907, Mickey, a dwarf son in 1909, Leah, who was average height, was born in 1911, then Elizabeth, a dwarf in 1914, Ari was born average height in 1917, and then the youngest was Piroska or Perla, the nickname she went by, a dwarf born in 1921. In 1923, when young Perla was just 18 months old, Shimshon Isaac Ovitz, their father, died of food poisoning from fish he ate at a wedding. He was 57 years old. Perla Ovitz's entry into this world was a harsh one. Her umbilical cord was actually wrapped around her neck. And the midwife took one look at her lifeless body and set her aside to allow her to die. Batia was exhausted after having given birth, but she asked to see the baby. The midwife grimly told Batia, let the baby rest in peace. Batia, as exhausted as she was, she sat up on her bed and demandingly said, bring the baby to me now. And the midwife obliged and Batia noticed that little Perla's jaw was actually locked shut. So she forced her index finger into the baby's mouth, cranked it open, and the baby began to cough. Perla survived, and when she was older, she jokingly attributed her large mouth to her mother's actions that day. Avram, the oldest son, stepped up as the man of the house after their father's death. Perla looked up to Avram, and when she was young, she actually thought that Avram was her father. She called him Papa, and none of the other siblings ever corrected her. It wasn't until one day when Perla was at a friend's house and Perla was telling her friend how generous her papa was and what a great person he was. The friend's mother actually overheard Perla referring to Avram as her papa, and the mother confronted Perla and said, he is not your papa, he is your brother. Perla very confidently responded with, oh yes, he is my papa, he gives me all my things, Everyone has a papa and so do I. The mother of the friend wouldn't let it go and said, Perla, he is your brother. Your real papa is dead. Perla ran home crying to her sister as she was very angry. And she said, how could that woman lie about Avram not being my papa? And the sisters just held her and tried to console her. And that's when Perla came to the realization that what her friend's mother was saying was true. And it took her actually biting her lip from then on to keep her from referring to her brother Avram as her papa. The Ovitzes lived in a house on the main street in the village of Rosavlia. Because there were more dwarfs in the family than average height family members, Shimshon Isaac had custom built parts of the home and furnished it to fit the needs of the little people in the family. It was almost like a life-sized dollhouse. Anything from smaller tables and shorter beds and lower chairs and the average height family members simply had to adjust although they did also have some uh, furniture that fit their build. Perla was very smart and she knew how to read even before starting elementary school. She would walk to school which was just a few doors down from where she lived but classmates and teachers would see her walking and they would pick her up as if she was a doll without asking her because she was so tiny and they just liked the idea of holding a living doll. Perla really enjoyed their company, so she never protested. Perla was a very good student. She was very dedicated to her studies, and she was actually allowed to skip PE or physical education since she could easily be knocked over by the other children. And so during that time, she would work on her homework. The other children would copy her homework later. Perla was actually never mocked at school for being little. The other children needed her to succeed in their studies, so they all respected her. Perla never felt upset about her dwarfism and she never felt like she didn't belong. There is safety in numbers. She was the youngest in the family of seven dwarf siblings and being around her other dwarf siblings really helped her to realize that she just would never grow tall. So she had no reason to feel insecure about her stature even though everyone else in the town was average height. Perla said that she never had dreams of 
her arms and legs being stretched out by a magical fairy to double her height. She just simply accepted the fact that she was a dwarf. And she never saw her dwarfism as a punishment. She always felt like their lives as, as dwarves was as worthy as anyone else's. Later in life, she would explain that she accepted the word dwarf, but she would never use the word dwarf to describe herself. Instead, she would use the word big people to describe average height people. One characteristic about the Ovitz family was that they were always very well dressed. Even though they were just three feet tall, they wore outfits that were age appropriate. Their clothes had to be tailored and their shoes had to be custom made since their feet were so wide. The women always had their nails polished and their hair was always nicely done. In her older years, Perla would say, as long as you breathe, you should look your best. The Ovid's children were all musically talented. Perla would sing cultural songs that her sisters taught her all day long. She would sing throughout the house from dawn until dusk. Unfortunately, in 1930, Batia, their mother, died of tuberculosis. Perla was nine years old and she just wondered one day why her siblings were all wearing black and sobbing. She loved her mother and was very close to her. And so her siblings just couldn't bear to tell Perla that their mother had died. Instead, in Perla's mind, it was as if she had just disappeared. Perla asked for mother and the siblings would just brush her off. So she went on an eating strike and adamantly said she would not eat until she could be united with mother. And the siblings had to actually hold her down and forcefully shove food down Perla's throat. And it wasn't until one day when she overheard her siblings saying, if she continues on this hunger strike, she will end up with mother. Perla shouted, yes, take me to where she is now. But when the siblings began sobbing, Perla finally understood that their mother was gone. On her deathbed, Perla's mother, Batia, had passed on words of wisdom that were grimly foreshadowing of very daunting events to come. She advised her children to always stick together. No matter what, never separate. Find a tree that allows you to work together. Little did they know that this advice was their key to survival in very dark years to come. The siblings obeyed their mother's wishes and stuck together. Even when they married, their significant others lived with them in the family home in the small Romanian village of Rosavlia. Sometimes it worked out and other times the significant other just couldn't handle the lifestyle of living with so many other extended family members and the marriage would end in divorce. It was just one of the siblings, Ari, that didn't stay in the family home and left to start a family in another village. Following in their father's footsteps as entertainers, the seven dwarves formed a band called the Lilliput Troop. They purchased child-sized instruments or had them custom made to fit their size. Rosica and Francisca, the two older sisters, each played quarter-sized violins. Freda had a cymbalon, custom made with shortened legs. Mickey played a half-sized cello and small accordion. Elizabeth played the drums and Perla played a tiny four-string pink guitar. Avram, the oldest, was the only one without an instrument and instead he sang and he acted and he was the MC or the masters of ceremonies. The other average height siblings were involved as well behind the scenes and would help with costumes and other logistics. The Lilliput troupe was always very elegantly dressed. The women wore beautiful evening gowns and the men wore white jackets with bow ties and they performed for two hours during which they sang love ballads and local hit music and different genres to entertain a variety of audiences. They sang in five different languages and they could speak fluently in Hungarian, Romanian, German, and Yiddish. In between songs, they entertained their audience with jokes and stand-up scenes that kept their audiences roaring with laughter. A childhood friend later recalled that the postal manager of the village, a very respectable and well-educated man during one of the shows, shouted out the name of a Russian song. And when Perla sang it ad hoc, the man had tears streaming down his face. The Ovitzes had this ability to evoke strong emotion through their music. Their performances always ended in standing ovations and audiences would fervently applaud and throw gifts like 
money and flowers onto the stage. One time, a heavy coin hit Perla, knocking her to the ground. And the Lilliput troupe actually had to establish a rule uh, from then on for the audience not to throw anything on stage and instead to actually put whatever gifts that they had to lay them on the stage after the performance. The Lilliput troupe traveled to many cities and countries throughout their career. They would travel mostly by train, although eventually they purchased a car, uh, an impressive rarity in their region, and similar to having a private jet in this day and age, it was big enough to fit all of them as well as their costumes and instruments. The Lilliput troupe became famous. People would get all dressed up and some would even travel to major cities to see them. They weren't just famous because they were dwarves performing. They were magnificent. They had talent. And if they didn't, their band would never have survived as long as it did. And most likely, neither would they. Perla had many gentlemen suitors interested in marrying her, but she would never pursue any love interests. She was too dedicated and focused on her music and her family. The 1940s was a very dark time in European history. As a highly religious Jewish family, the Obitzes had so many close calls in the beginning of the Nazi regime occupation throughout Europe. At one point, they had to go to the government office in Budapest for identification cards. They used all the charm and confidence and skills that they had acquired as performers on stage, and they were able to avoid being asked the one important question. They were very lucky, and in the end, they received their identification cards without the word Jew written on it. Even in the beginning of 1944, when more than four million Jews had already been killed and hundreds of thousands were imprisoned in concentration camps, the Ovitz family was still able to escape the harsh brutalities of the war and devastation that surrounded them. And they even managed to continue working as musicians and traveled hundreds of miles away from their home for the performances. However, they soon began to feel the impacts of the war. They had to sew the Star of David on their clothing and their jewelry and valuables and other possessions were taken away. Their radio was also taken away to isolate them from what was happening in the outside world. Then it all came crashing down in March, 1944, when the German army invaded the Ovitz's home country. In April 1944, a decree was signed ordering the ghettoization of Jews in their area. They then heard an announcement in the street ordering all Jews to pack their belongings and move to the synagogue. They were shocked, but they still never imagined what was in store for them. By then, the dwarf's average height male relatives had been sent to labor camps, and so the Ovitz family figured that the same might happen to them. Because of the crowded conditions in the synagogue and the dwarf's limited lung capacity due to the pseudoachondroplasia, it just made it likely that they would pass out in the crowded synagogue, so they were actually allowed to stay in their home next door. But they paid a price. There was a loud, aggressive knock at the door in the middle of the night. It was drunk, armed soldiers looking for entertainment. And they demanded that the dwarfs play their instruments. They shouted out songs for them to sing, including love ballads. And so the dwarves obliged, of course, but all Perla wanted to do was cry. They did this every night for the next week, and it was humiliating, and they couldn't help but wonder what all their fellow Jews in the horrible crowded conditions in the synagogue next door were thinking hearing the merry music coming from the Ovitz's house. A week later, there was another order once again, to transfer all the Jews. They were to be locked in a ghetto with other Jews from 13 other villages in the town of Dragomiresti. It was a half day journey on foot and the conditions were horrible in the ghetto. The lucky ones, which included the Ovitz family, were cramped in a tiny flat with 20 other people. About a month later, they were ordered to leave once again and were led to a cattle train where they were cramped in dark, overstuffed freight wagons with no airflow and without food or water and no way to sit. The dwarves found refuge in a corner, but they were packed so tightly that they could barely breathe in the crowded train. The trip lasted three long, excruciating days and nights with few stops in between 
until they finally arrived at Auschwitz on May 19, 1944. Auschwitz is a Jewish concentration camp in German-occupied Poland that is notoriously known as one of the most lethal extermination camps. Over the course of World War II, over one million Jews died in Auschwitz. The doors to the wagon of the train flung open and everyone on board was met with dogs barking aggressively and guards harshly yelling out orders. Twins step out, women and children in one line, men in another line. A neighbor and good friend, Simon Slomowitz, carried the dwarves down from the train. The dwarves were quite a sight and they were also very charming. They used their experience performing on stage to captivate the guards and indeed the Nazi guards were intrigued by them and formed a protective circle around them. Chaya Slomowitz, Simon's wife, noticed that unlike the other Jews, the dwarves were being treated kindly by the guards and not being pushed at and yelled at. In a fateful decision that would later save the Slomowitz's lives, Shia made her way towards the dwarves and pretended to be family. The dwarves did not protest, they didn't say anything, and the Nazi guards allowed them to step out of line and join the Ovitz family. The Nazi guards knew that Joseph Mengele, one of the doctors at Auschwitz, also known as the Angel of Death, was collecting families with genetic differences. It was the middle of the night but they ran to wake him up and tell him about this unique and marvelous find. As the dwarves were waiting by the train ramp for Dr. Mengele, one of the Jewish prisoners approached them and waved to the Ovitzes to try to catch their attention. Her name was Regina, and she was assigned to do harsh labor at Auschwitz. She was 24 years old, but her body was wasted away from starvation. She had open sores all over her body and she was so weak she could hardly walk. She could barely stand so that morning when they were called out to work for the day she laid in the barrack ready to face her fate in the gas chamber. On that day one of the other women in the barracks pleaded with her and said you must go out and work. You cannot stay here and sleep in the barrack. They will send you directly to the gas chambers. Please go. The woman helped Regina to her feet and told her go out and find some place to hide and when everyone returns, come back into the barracks with them so that the guards will not suspect that you haven't been out doing the harsh labor. So Regina found a place to sleep in the hidden area near the barrack and at one point it began to rain. The rain soon became quite heavy and this woke up Regina and once she awoke, she heard this unusual racket coming from the train ramp and it was the commotion that was caused by the arrival of the seven dwarfs of Rosavlia. So she walked over to see and as soon as Regina saw them, she just couldn't believe her eyes. As weak as she was, she gathered all the strength in her to walk over where they were and she waved to them, interrupting their conversation with the guards. Elizabeth, one of the dwarf siblings, cautiously asked, who are you? Regina was unrecognizable from her previous life. Regina told Elizabeth her nickname and just as she was explaining who she was, one of the guards hit Regina with his gun, knocking her to the ground. Elizabeth whispered something to the guards and later Regina was summoned over to Dr. Mengele's clinic where she was reunited with the dwarfs, which were her family. It turned out Regina was the dwarf's cousin. Although Regina's family had all been killed at Auschwitz, she was shocked when she awoke that evening and turned the corner to see her seven dwarf relatives. In years to follow after the war ended, Regina would cry with intense gratitude whenever it rained heavily because the rain brought the memory of that fateful day at Auschwitz. Had it not been for the rain, she would never have woken up and been lured by the commotion and she would never have made that connection to her dwarf family that ultimately saved her life. While the dwarves were standing on the train ramp, they watched as rows and rows of Jews walked towards the building with the chimney stacks that continuously poured out flames and smoke. Perla asked, what is that smoke all about? One of the Jewish prisoners wearing a striped garment that had been in the concentration camp for some time and was reduced to skin and bones replied, don't you know where you are? You are in Auschwitz, a death camp, and eventually you too will end up in the oven. 
And suddenly, Perla couldn't help but see each flame from the stack as ghostly human figures flying up and dissolving into the air. Joseph Mengele was a doctor in the Nazi concentration camp. He was licensed to practice medicine. Dr. Mengele was fascinated by the genetics of dominant abnormalities. In 1937, Dr. Mengele joined the Nazi party and a year later he joined the Schutzstaffel or SS. The SS was a military organization under the Nazi regime. In 1943, Dr. Mengele applied for and obtained a position at Auschwitz-Birkenau also known as Auschwitz II, where he would have an endless supply of human species to conduct his research on. Dr. Mengele was one of the doctors in charge of standing just outside the train ramp and just with a flick of his finger, he would decide who would go to their immediate death and who would be assigned to harsh labor and or be subjected to human experimentation, hence the nickname Angel of Death. Dr. Mengele was interested in twins, but he was also collecting what he considered to be striking human mutations. He also had been advised by his mentor that researching whole families was ideal for comprehensively studying genetic mutations. So when the dwarfs arrived and there were seven of them and they were all related, Dr. Mengele felt like he had hit the ultimate genetic jackpot and he protected them from being gassed to death. Had the dwarves arrived separately at Auschwitz, they probably would have been sent directly to the gas chambers upon arrival. Being in a large group saved them from being killed, but they were soon to be the subject of extremely ruthful and painful human experiments. They were imprisoned at Auschwitz, but for the human experimentations, they were picked up by military vehicles and transported to Birkenau or Auschwitz II. At that time, there were laws that were prohibiting what you could do to laboratory animals, but there were no restrictions on what could be done to humans in the death camps. Thousands of young prisoners suffered radiation, repeated injections with various chemical substances, surgeries without anesthesia, and castrations. They were forced to have intercourse with other inmates to contract syphilis. Those who did not die in the name of Nazi science often ended up gruesomely maimed. Orders for blood draws for the Ovitz family occurred every few days. These blood draws were excruciatingly painful. The staff that carried out the blood draws were prisoners as well but they showed no mercy as they carelessly stabbed the patients and blood splattered everywhere. The dwarfs would often faint, but once they were revived, they would have to continue the blood draws. They drew an enormous amount of blood each time, and this would make them feel nauseous at times and vomit. Dr. Mengele would order the doctors to pour boiling hot water and then freezing cold water in the dwarf's ears. And this made them feel like they were going to be driven to insanity, that doctors put eye drops in their eyes, they would blind them for hours, teeth were extracted, hair and eyelashes were pulled out. They did gynecological exams on the female dwarfs that would leave them pale and shaken. The Ovitz family felt anxious every time they were propped naked and face down on a clinic table. They didn't know what horrible exam would be carried out on them, but they did feel like they were su uselessly subjected to painful human experimentation without any real advancement or benefit to science. It also seemed like the tests would never end. The silver lining was that these battery of tests ordered by Dr. Mengele were keeping them alive. And the men and women of its family members whom were separated at the barracks in Auschwitz were able to see each other at the clinic in Auschwitz too. The dwarves were not just medical subjects for Dr. Mengele's experiments, they were also asked to perform for the soldiers. On occasion, Elizabeth was commanded by a kitchen supervisor to sing sad ballads in a private area of the building. The German women would have tears streaming down her face as Elizabeth sang. And this continued night after night. One evening, Dr. Mengele arrived at the women's barrack holding a package. He told the Ovitz family to dress in their finest clothes as they would be going out for the evening. Then he placed the package down in the room and left. 
The women opened the package carefully and suspiciously, but were delighted to find high quality makeup. The Ovitz family, unlike other prisoners, were allowed to keep their luggage once they got off the train because they could not fit into the prisoner uniforms. So they were allowed to wear their own clothes at Auschwitz. So they got dressed up and put their makeup on and discussed amongst themselves what songs they would perform. They were escorted out to the military vehicle where they were joined with the men of the family. There, they were driven to a new part of the camp that housed the German guards. There they were given a nice meal and then afterwards they were led to a stage. Dr. Mengele was at the front of the stage and the audience was filled with Germans wearing metal covered uniforms. Dr. Mengele turned to the dwarfs and to their horror ordered them to take off their clothes. The dwarfs were not there to perform songs. They were actually there to be displayed as Dr. Mengele's medical subjects. In three months, with the numerous experiments Dr. Mengele had performed on his subjects, he did not have concrete data to report to showcase his research. He had the dwarfs naked on display as a way to deflect from the fact that he had nothing noteworthy to publish and present. By January 1945, the Russian military was closing in and the German army knew that defeat was in the not too distant future. The writing was on the wall. Dr. Mengele, who had once told the Ovitz family, if I leave, I'm taking you with me wherever I go, furiously gathered papers in his office, threw them in a car, slammed the door and drove off, never to be seen by the Ovitz family again. In fact, most of the Nazis at Auschwitz fled the concentration camp. The dwarves lived in fear every day and every night after that. Without Dr. Mengele, they were more vulnerable and likely to be killed. Even though they feared being subjected to painful and humiliating experiments, they knew that they were safe as long as Dr. Mengele was around. They remained hidden away in the barracks with no food and no essential needs. The remaining guards would gas prisoners and shoot prisoners at random. One time they set a barrack on fire, killing 300 Jews all at once. Auschwitz had become an eerily quiet and desolate place. On January 27, 1945, 10 days after Dr. Mengele fled, the Russian army entered the concentration camp. They were a very rowdy bunch and asked the Ovitz family to perform for them while they acted belligerent and drank vodka. The Ovitzes, who spoke various languages, performed the Russian songs that they had in their repertoire. By the end of the war, nine out of 10 people who entered the gates of Auschwitz were killed in gas chambers. Families were separated at the train ramp and those that survived and were forced to do hard labor were usually the only one in the family that survived if they managed to not be killed in some sadistic manner by the guards or die from disease. The Ovitz family and their neighbor, the Slomowitz, who basically passed as part of the Ovitz family, were the only entire families who entered Auschwitz together and made it out together and alive. The Ovitz's dwarfism saved their lives. The day after the liberation of the camp, the Ovitz family and the Somowitz family began the long journey to their home in Rosavlia. As they passed through villages and witnessed the destruction around them, they realized that they would likely not find their home intact. It was also very dangerous. They were at the mercy of drunk Russian soldiers on the streets, and there were also Polish peasants whom they feared might resent the Jews and kill them. When the dwarves finally made it back home to Rosavlia, they discovered their home had been looted. Most of the furniture was gone, the door was broken, and the floorboards had been taken apart, most likely to see if any valuables were being stashed underneath them. But they soon remembered the jewelry, gold coins, and other valuables that they had hidden in a jar that they buried underneath their car. Just before they had been sent away to the Jewish ghetto in Dragomiresti, they frantically searched their house for a place to hide their valuables. And then they remembered their car. One advantage of their dwarfism is that they were able to crawl underneath their vehicle, dig a pit, and bury their valuables. Their car had still been where they left it, 
no one attempted to move it, so Mickey and Avram waited until midnight and then crawled underneath the car and began digging quickly and quietly. They started to feel something hard and they couldn't believe it when they unearthed the jar filled with valuables. The dwarfs soon learned of family members who had been killed during the war. Their average height brother Ari, who was the only family member to leave the family home and start a life in another village, had been shot and killed when he tried to escape a labor camp. And his wife and their baby were gassed at Auschwitz. Freda's husband died of hunger in the labor camp. The husbands of Elizabeth and Leah, who were also sent to labor camps, survived and would eventually be reunited with the family. As the dwarves began to settle in their new life back home in Rosavlia, they realized that it had turned into a ghost town. The synagogue had been destroyed and there were no longer familiar faces of their neighbors and livelihood in the street. They knew they would not be able to make a living and survive, so they fled to Belgium, which was the only country that granted them entry visas. Before moving to Belgium, they visited the graves of their mother and father one last time. There they wept as they said one last goodbye because they knew that they would never step foot in their home country ever again. In Belgium, the Lilliput troupe found an apartment and began performing again, but they made adjustments to their repertoire. They even created a comedy skit where Perla and Mickey and Elizabeth were tailors and helplessly tended to an exceptionally tall man. The audience enjoyed their performances and they were a hit. The Obitzes were regaining a sense of normalcy in their lives. However, two years after they moved to Belgium, they received a very nice offer that was hard to resist by the impresario Irving Jacobson in New York. An impresario is a manager of a theater. He offered the Lilliput troupe a long-term contract to perform in one of New York's Yiddish theaters. The pay that they were offered under the contract was excellent as well. At the same time, Israeli immigrant ambassadors were traveling all over Europe, recruiting Holocaust survivors to migrate to the new Jewish state. This was also an offer that the Ovitzes couldn't refuse. Their family debated their next move. They had to decide between New York and Israel. It was Avram, the oldest brother, the head of the family, who made the final decision. So on May 4th, 1949, the Lilliput troop, along with 2,000 other passengers, set sail aboard the Independence. They celebrated Israel's first Independence Day in the middle of the Mediterranean. When the Ovitzes disembarked the ship in Israel, many people stared at the unusual sight of seven dwarfs carefully making their way down the ramp. Someone addressed the crowd saying, they're human beings like us, only small. Of all people, Jews should not be prejudiced. Pedala stepped out and stated, millions of people have been watching us throughout our entire lives. Naturally, we'd like to be no different than you, but if this is the shape God destined for us, we have no complaints. The Ovitzes settled in Israel and they were soon booked at the Palace Hall in Haifa, one of the most prestigious halls in Israel. Performances were sold out. The Lilliput troupe was very famous before the war. They had traveled to other countries in Europe to perform at the height of their career. So, for many audience members, it was like a trip down memory lane that brought powerful feelings of nostalgia, especially for a culture that had been devastated by the war. Audience members would cry and laugh and they would congregate in the lobby and fellow Jews would recognize each other from before the war and embrace. After their first season, Avram, the head of the household, began preparing for the next writing comedy skits, which is what the audience reacted to the best during the previous season. This included a skit where Perla played Cupid in a white elegant dress and shot arrows at a couple that bickered at each other. She played an awkward secretary at a job interview. She played a student who impressed her teacher and she even played an old lady. She was so convincing with makeup and white powder in her hair that the audience members were shocked when they went backstage and realized what she really looked like. 
The skit Death Tango, in which Elizabeth played an unfaithful girlfriend who was a sensuous tango dancer, always received standing ovations. 25 years after having formed the Lily Pit Troupe, the family retired from performing. They were exhausted after all that they had overcome, the Holocaust and being displaced from their homes. They decided to run a box office theater. Each family member had a role. Perla's job was to sell tickets at the box office, and she was so very charming that customers would often bring her small gifts because they just enjoyed chatting with her. At 35 years old, Perla got engaged to a man named Jonel, who won her over. However, about two weeks before their wedding, Perla heard that Jonel had been boasting that the property and businesses owned by the dwarfs would soon be his. Perla called off the wedding. The family went through many changes in the coming years. There were marriages, divorces, and grandchildren were born. In 1972, the family was devastated when brother Mickey died of a heart attack at the age of 63. Five months later, brother Avram, the head of the household, died at the age of 69. Then Leah had a major stroke that left her paralyzed and wheelchair bound for the next 14 years until her death. Freda died in 1975. In 1979, the remaining siblings sold the cinema and moved into a large flat. Francisca died in 1980 at age 91. Rosica died in 1984 at age 98. In 1992, Elizabeth passed away, and in 1993, Sarah passed away. Perla was 72 years old when she found herself alone for the first time in her life. She was the only surviving sibling. All on her own, Perla spent her days alone in her flat, and she tried to be as independent as possible. She even would sew her own dresses and likened her family to the dwarves in fairy tales. Always diligent and hardworking, better craftsmen than tall people she would say. Perla Ovitz, the last of the seven dwarfs, passed away peacefully on September 9th, 2001, at the age of 80. As for Dr. Mengele, even though he was declared a major war criminal by the United Nations War Crimes Commission, he managed to remain hidden in an isolated farm and avoid capture for some time. With his first marriage coming to an end, Dr. Mengele moved to Argentina and remarried. From there, he moved several times as a fugitive under different aliases, barely escaping arrest each time. He continued his experiments on twins in a small Brazilian town called Candido Godoy under the guise of offering medical treatment. The rate of twin births increased in that town from one in 80 to one in five. And it's actually now known as the town of twins. In 1979, Joseph Mengele suffered a stroke while swimming at a coastal resort in Brazil and died. The traumatic experience at Auschwitz haunted the dwarves for years. Their nephew recalled that he would wake up to his aunts and uncles screaming in their sleep. Later in life, Perla would say that she never hated Dr. Mengele even though she should have because he was a murderer, but he let her and her family live, even if it was just for the sake of furthering his ambition of becoming a famous scientist. Although Mengele was never caught, a trial in absentia was held. In her testimony, Perla would state, I was saved by the grace of the devil. Perla would later recount that when she heard of Dr. Mengele's death, she cried all night. In a sort of Stockholm Syndrome-like manner, Perla rationalized this emotion by stating, the heart is the stupidest organ. Dr. Mengele had a heart of stone, but mine is human flesh and blood. So I hope you guys enjoyed this story time. Thank you so much for watching, and I will catch you in the next video. Bye for now.